I still can't get over this fanciness, you know? Every week I'm learning a little bit more and it just feels great. See, look, now I'm a circle. <laughs> uh, tonight's caring conversation is really going to focus on wordless picture books. And I'm going to walk you through a few concepts because, of course, it's Dr. Keisha Cares. So I want to share uh, some bits of research with you. Um, of course, welcome. But the overview of what we're going to delve into, I'm going to uh, first give a brief overview of uh, my credentials and where I stand and how you can get uh, in contact with all the things that I'm doing. And then I want to delve into linguistic diversity, developing criticality, and then show you how these concepts can be applied within the wordless picture books uh, that I've curated. Right. There we go. So let me <laughs> meta picture in picture in picture. <laughs> so my name, as I shared, I am Dr. Keisha. Uh, my background is in English language education, specifically with a focus in early childhood literacy, parent-child literacy. I did my doctorate at the University of Hong Kong and my master's in Beijing Normal University. And I am now in the U.S. And it is my joy under the Caring Conversations banner to share all of this information with you. I am a global literacy consultant. That means I work with uh, parents in Singapore. I have parents in Hong Kong. And I also uh, support education policy uh, through respective organizations, such as the OECD Education 2030 Project. So my ability to be on YouTube with you is such a joy because it allows me uh, to come full circle to where I started and talk directly to parents talk directly with educators, and talk directly to students or just adults who want this information. So it is always with great joy that I host these caring conversations. So whether you're on the live or you're watching the replay, this information is personally curated by me for you. And if you miss anything or you want to stay in touch and know what I'm up to in terms of the most up-to-date information, there is a website uh, drkeishacares.com, and across all of the major social media uh, platforms except Twitch and TikTok, because I'm still getting on those levels, you can still find me at Dr. Keisha Cares. And in the course of any of the things I mentioned, if you want to work with me, I work with schools, I work with organizations, I do professional development, and I do parent consultations, which I absolutely love, and I'll talk about that. But all of that information is on the website. And for parents, I made sure my fees were very, very affordable. So it's well within your reach. Um, that service is more of a passion uh, project. So if you want to work with me, shoot me an email or schedule a consultation. We'll definitely do something out. Now let's get into the presentation. Move the picture. There we go. <laughs> so what does the term linguistic diversity uh, really entail? Well, it speaks to the fact that you have an awareness or and sometimes the ability to speak in more than one language. And like linguistic, linguistic diversity also points to the fact that more than half of the world's population is multilingual. So when you think about places like India, you think about the continent of Africa, you think about places where you're going to hear a multiple array of languages. If you're thinking about Europe, you'll come across French, English, Swedish, all these different languages. If you're thinking about Africa, uh, you'll hear a whole multiplicity of languages and dialects and all of these things. And so linguistic diversity is just highlighting all of the different languages that the world offers and creating a atmosphere where you're exposing young children to uh, different languages, whether they're fluent or not, just the mere exposure to these concepts has great ramifications in terms of how they begin to understand the world. Like this is what, okay, I'm, a, I'm gonna geek out because this is what I do, but this is when it gets fascinating. So learning an additional language can provide an understanding of different perspectives in and of itself. What do you mean, Dr. Keisha? Glad you asked, let me tell you. So when I talk about understanding different perspectives, 
Even if we're talking about a toddler, early childhood, which is birth to five years old, wherever they are, just that exposure to the different language immediately signals to the child that there is a difference in the way people speak. Uh, say you have a child where one parent is speaking in English, the other parent is speaking in Swahili or Spanish. If that child grows up into that atmosphere, by year one, they'll be able to respond back. If not, um, year two, you know, just loose, loose numbers. They'll be able to respond back. And if one parent is consistently speaking to the child in a different language and the other parent is speaking to the child, say English is the dominant language of that parent and the other parent is speaking in Spanish, by that young age, the child will know which parent to respond to in which language. So just in that light activity alone, your child is beginning to have that diversity and understanding that there's more than one way to have a conversation or more than one way to communicate. And so as you begin to explore what those differences are, you're already creating those pathways to explore different cultures, different ways of looking at the world, different geographic locations. Because if you're talking about Spanish and the child speaks Spanish, then you can begin to widen their eyes to where Spanish is the native language. And if they're speaking English, then you can also expand that and have them understand that English is spoken all over the world, but in certain countries, it's a native language. And so you see how you can begin to build on that pathway of linguistic diversity to start to bring in these understandings of diversity in general and all the different cultures and what this means. And the other wonderful thing about approaching uh, linguistic diversity or even looking at it in this way is that this early exposure to multilingual environments helps children avoid an egocentric way of understanding their social world in the sense of if they go somewhere else and they see other people speaking a certain language, it moves them beyond the first person context of assuming that everyone speaks English or everyone speaks Spanish or everyone speaks a specific language. It widens the whole entire perspective because they were already introduced to different languages. So when they come across a new language, there's more of a sense of awe and less of a sense of insecurity, which is having taught as a second language teacher, that's sometimes a bit of a stumbling block and people learning additional languages. You feel, or they describe feelings of intimidation feeling lost, feeling left out when conversations are occurring in different languages versus someone who may be very open to linguistic diversity or have access to multiple languages. Whether they speak it or not, that exposure may encourage them to look for the nuances such as body language, tone, the way the person is communicating joy, like they be more, they may be more apt to look at the other ways that communication happens because they're socialized to understand this diversity. I can continue going on in that in this direction because I find the topic so fascinating. But I just want to give you a light overview of what linguistic diversity means, and I've shared uh, a research-based resource. And I'll make sure I link the actual uh, academic journal in the description in case you really want to delve deeper into this. But the um, research I listed below describes an experiment that they did with children uh, between the ages of four to six. They did a study on uh, 72 children in Chicago. And it was just fascinating to see some of the children were bilingual some of the children just had light exposure to another language, which means someone in the household or someone in the extended family spoke a different language, such as Spanish, uh, Polish, German, uh, French, Mandarin. And then you have your monolingual children who weren't exposed to any language. And through their social experiment, they found that just exposure alone 
allow the child to pick up social cues and nuances that the monolingual child didn't catch on to because they were used to just seeing things from one way. And the research begins to share that if we consider linguistic diversity, if we consider uh, exposing our children to multilingual facets of understanding language, then we are also helping the children develop better communication skills. And this is so important to highlight, and the study highlights this as well. Simply picking up another language does not automatically mean that you have better communication skills. All that really suggests is that you have the ability to communicate with someone from a different linguistic background, but the ability to communicate effectively, that's a higher order skill that's across the board. And so the ability to be such as respectful uh, in conversation, the ability to resist the urge to interrupt, or just the, the etiquette of communication or the ability to interpret what isn't said, those are other strong things that can come through that exposure to different languages because you're learning different tones, you're learning different ways in which people communicate. And all of this, particularly at the early childhood stage, really helps evolve into a human being who has a stronger sense of effective communication. I went deep in, but you know, Dr. Keish cares, right? Uh, let's go to the next slide. Now, this is a short uh, presentation. I kept it to six slides. So we will spend the bulk of this time really delving into the books and answering any questions you might have. But, you know, I want to teach a little bit. I love teaching. So when we talk about developing criticality, what on earth does that mean? Now, as the woke educator that I am, this is my, mm, this is, this is, this is my area. Like when we talk about anti-racist theory or when we talk about um, cultivating genius, shout out, love your book, uh, Dr. Muhammad. Um, when we talk about these areas, here is the ultimate goal. Developing criticality is when you're starting to raise children who are able to, first of all, put their intellect in action. So all the books that I've been sharing with you so far and the many great books that just came in and you haven't even seen yet and all the ways in which uh, Dr. Keisha Cares is approaching early childhood literacy or is approaching creating that library of picture books or that exposure to picture books is all about supporting diversity, all about supporting a global understanding of the world in which they live, all of the beautiful differences, but also being aware of the history that some of these foundational concepts of humanity are built on. And what we see in a lot of the anti-racist literature that's out and a lot of the talks that are moving forward there is a heightened understanding that some of these things need to be dismantled if we're truly going to move forward in an anti-racist way. So helping a child understand, like example, the conversation around defunding the police. There is a consensus in some areas, disagreement in others, but there is a conversation that is going forward that says there is an imbalance and how policing is occurring in certain communities. And we need to think about that more critically and think about if putting financial resources in one pot of policing is truly the best use of community dollars. So if we're talking about intellect and action from this example, then you're teaching a child to be able to think through the standard narrative that simply says, if we're sticking with this metaphor, that all police are here to help and you're safe and, you know, do what the cop says and, you know, just walk into this as though the police officer is your friend. And, you know, this is Dr. Keisha being Dr. Keisha. You can still find a lot of children's books that show the friendly officer. And yes, there are some components of the uh, police force that fit that category. But there is that dark underbelly, that is that hidden side that, well, not so hidden now, but in children's literacy, there is that, uh, that antagonist side that we're seeing 
uh, resulting in the murder of a lot of innocent or presumed guilty uh, individuals across the board. And we're understanding that there is a difference in how people are treated. So when you talk about intellect and action, the ability to start to teach young children to detect falsehoods in the language of others, that could be written language, that could be verbal language. Um, if you've been following my work or following the caring conversations, it's a child who does not allow themselves to be put in a situation where they only play with one group of people. It's that child who's empowered to say, I want to play with um, Sarah in the wheelchair, or they resist the urge to uh, go with the crowd, or they resist the ability to just follow along with the dominant statement or the dominant position. They question things because they have been exposed to anti-racist or more inclusive um, books, literature, practices. So when someone tries to direct them in a negative way, such as bullying, I can step away from race and just talk about social emotional strength, such as bullying. If that were to come forward, you would have a child that would be equipped to stand up to bullying, to recognize forms of bullying or manipulation, because bullying isn't always a child being physically uh, hit. Sometimes it's verbal or emotional intimidation. So that child who knows to, first of all, stand up for themselves, secondly, inform the care, uh, the teacher or whoever the assistant is in the room. And if it needs to be escalated, go home, tell the adult, like the child who knows how to hit all those levels or even be aware that something is wrong is showing a child that's starting to not only develop criticality, but they're able to put it in action. Yay. Um, criticality. What is criticality in and of itself, right? So this whole aspect is when this is like, I don't have children, but this is like my dream child. <laughs> like when I think about developing criticality or having a child that has criticality, I see a child that has read a lot of picture books with, you know, Dr. Keisha or has parents who absolutely follow the curriculum I suggest and say if they're always used to seeing diversity in children's books or they're always used to being exposed to various perspectives or they read with a sense of equality and inclusion in the narratives, this would be a child that might point out if they're reading a book uh, where all the characters are one uh, dominant skin tone, if you don't know, say they're all white, um, the child may get through the end of the book and just say, I wonder why, or they may come to a grocery store scene uh, where they know in real life you see a lot more diversity. And they may question that, like, why don't we see more diversity in this uh, picture? Why is it that everyone in this picture looks the same? When we go to the grocery store or when I go to school, I see all of these different colors. Yes, that is a child that is absolutely putting criticality in action at a young age, that whole curiosity, because a lot of children show their critical skills in the questions that they ask, in the way in which they question what they're exposed to in the context of their world as they understand it, being that they're little people, they're looking at the world consistently asking questions. And the questions are their critical reasoning skills beginning to show through. It is absolutely fascinating when you see this. And if you continue to encourage that through the books that you uh, expose them to, do, through the events that they attend, for example, a lot of the children that have participated in protests, they've had the experience of drawing a protest sign, holding up that protest sign, hearing other adults and other littles talk about power, equality. And for the older kids, they may be able to grasp the concept of anti-oppression, but all kids understand fair and unfair. 
that's the language they speak. They are really quick to point out when something's not fair. So when it's explained to them in these ways, the criticality that they take from those experiential learning opportunities, I can't wait to hear what type of stories are going to occur when children are back in the classroom in the fall or when they're back in the online uh, classroom. Whatever socialization brings us back into where we're uh, able to be around each other more. It's going to be very interesting not only to see how classroom behaviors begin to interact, but it's going to be fascinating to see how these children mature. And we're already seeing examples of that. When you look at, I believe it's Generation Z, when you see how, um, and I'll even talk about you know the Parkland shooting, how a lot of those students immediately rallied to organizing and student agency and all of these things. So when you talk about criticality, that ability to understand that something is wrong, like those Parkland, Florida students joined the larger movement of we need to do something about guns um, in the U.S. And their ability to begin to organize and talk about these things and rally and then use their technology skill sets to get the world informed that's criticality in action, and that's what it can mature into as children continue to develop. Now, the goal of criticality, the ultimate thing you want to see happen in terms of criticality is the ability to question the world and texts that they're exposed to. So this is the ability to hear things, the ability to read or see or intake media, and better understand the hidden nuances or the biases of what they may be learning because they understand how to critically analyze and read on their own what is the history of this subject. If you think about statues, there's a lot of dialogue on statues, whether they should stay, whether they should be pulled down. And the mainstream uh, media may say one thing, but if they have that additional context or they think critically, they may have that desire to delve into this further by reading, by having more conversations with people uh, who may represent the ethnic group that is deeply offended. Um, Christopher Columbus is a very controversial uh, historical figure. So if you had a child that was thinking critically or was exercising uh, the goals of criticality, they would not only want to hear what the mainstream narrative is of why the statue should stay, they may go out of their way to get in touch with the local indigenous uh, tribes in their land or go on some of those websites and understand why Columbus is such a problem from that um, minority or that ethnic group or that culture's point of view. And if you're wondering, can you really do all that in early childhood? you can start to develop these critical skills. Because again, as I've shown you in past caring conversations, children's abilities in terms of their higher cognitive skills, their sensory pathways, their vision and hearing pathways are off the charts. So everything you're pouring into them during those foundational development years is like putting a strong foundation that you can continually build upon. So when we talk about linguistic diversity, what I shared in the very beginning, creating those pathways, criticality is like the next level that you start to build because they're already aware that you can communicate effectively in multiple languages. So if English is one option, Spanish is another, Mandarin is another, they're already seeing through language that it's the same thing. There's no pedestal, right? I just said a lot in that statement. There's no pedestal. And if language can be treated equally or if they're even going deeper, but if language at that level can have the same impact as to where I can communicate with various people, then what else is out there? Because each culture takes you into a whole different experience. This is how you begin to build upon these things. When you talk about bringing in criticality, it's showing them storybooks and bringing in a lot of the other things I've already shared. But this is just the beginning. If you want to go deeper, oh, please, 
schedule a consultation and let me curate uh, some outstanding uh, resources for you to develop criticality based on your unique child. Because every child is different. Every child has their own interests, how they want to interact with the world, how they understand the world. There is no one mode fits all. Some kids prefer graphic novels. Some kids prefer picture books. There's a wide variety in which the world uh, can be presented in terms of children's books to kids. And I would love to help, but uh, definitely get in touch if you want to move forward. Now let's get into one of my favorite parts. We're going to talk about wordless picture books. And this is the time if you have questions, this is when you can start to share or type in your questions. Uh, I'm going to continue to share uh, the picture recommendations. And if I see a question or a comment, I'll be sure to stop and address that. And if you guys just decide that you want to enjoy the picture books, then I'll just keep talking and sharing books until our hour is up. Okay. There's a lot of flexibility, no pressure. So uh, let me now go into the larger screen because we're now at the part where I get to show these books. Yay, here I am. Okay, so you see my little suggestion at the bottom, so you know what time it is. And now let's go into the curated picture books that I have to support the two concepts of linguistic diversity and criticality. Okay, now starting at the very beginning, okay? Oh, I guess I'm beeping. <laughs> Sorry. Starting at the very beginning, you have this baby board book, and it's a picture book for the most part. You have some light language, but the main thing that it's showing is this whole idea of different cultures. I'm going to try and navigate this so that the glare isn't as dominant as it can be. There we go. There we go. So if you see in this book, you see immediately pictures of babies, and then it tells you where they are in the world. I feel like I'm taking you on a tour as I try to get the angle right. <laughs> Let me see if I cut this light off. Yeah, I will sacrifice that light so that you can see this picture book better. And look at that, Afghanistan, Peru. So children are being exposed to all this beautiful diversity, but they're also seeing these different worldly contexts of what's around them. And when we talk about different languages, here's yet another opportunity to share that each one of these babies speaks a different native language. Right? You see the Mali child, you see the child in Greenland, and it leaves room to begin to just show this is South Africa, you know, all of this diversity, but they're all babies. And so this is one way at the board book level to start introducing your child to pictures. And I don't know what it is, but babies prefer photographs of other babies. Like if you've ever seen a child watching another child, they, they really take to the actual photographs versus paintings or drawings. So this is just a great way to begin that or continue that work of introducing your baby to the world, okay? And again, I will always share any books that I mention in the description uh, once this video is made um, publicly available. So if, don't worry about taking all the notes. I'll have that for you. Now, I want to go a little further or a little deeper and share one of my absolute favorites, um, Bill Thompson's Chalk. I have loved this story for years, and it continues to be one of my favorites because it is a wordless picture book. But when I talk about using wordless picture books to support um, multilingual learning or bilingual or trilingual picture books provide you with opportunities to bring in storytellers who may not speak the dominant language. Okay. Gonna, there we go. Who may not speak the dominant language. So if English is the dominant language or 
Mandarin is the dominant language. With the wordless picture book, you invite someone else to tell a story in the language they're comfortable with. And if you are a dual or multilingual speaker, you can move and choose between how you want to tell the story. So for example, one page, you can tell this part in uh, one language. You can move to a different language when you're explaining this page. It allows the child who may not have a full vocabulary, who may not be able to read, okay, to participate in the idea of telling the story. Because when you're reading aloud to a child, particularly if it's happening consistently, they're always seeing the adult read for the most part. If you have a younger child or another person reading, if they can't read themselves. And sometimes they'll usually show independence by getting a book and flipping through it and coming up with, you know, whatever story they make up on the spot. But a wordless picture books allows them to replicate the whole concept of telling a story and keeping up with that narrative. As the adult reading with the child, it gives you a hidden opportunity to see where their development is in terms of their vocabulary. If they're learning a different language, how are they using that in this real authentic learning experience? Because they're having to tell the story. And if you're looking at it from the criticality point of view, what story are they making up about what they're seeing in terms of the diversity of the characters. What stories are they telling? Are they friends? Are they brothers and sisters? Like you see all these little nuances. And again, because you're talking about multiple languages, you can play around with how you interact. Um, she may decide, based, if we go back to the board book I just showed you, right? They just saw all these amazing babies. So. This child could be from South Africa. This child could be from Greenland. This child could be from who knows, you know? This, she may say this child's from the US. Like it's just great to see where their imaginations take the story. And so you can just see from the pictures I'm already showing you how much richness is in this wordless picture book and all of the opportunities to really explore a story. And the great thing about a wordless picture book is that you're never tied to one narrative. You will be amazed at how creative uh, your child's mind can be. And even though they may know the story in terms of what the pictures say, they may consistently change how we go from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. And that is why I love wordless picture books. Uh, Bill Thompson, you did an excellent job with chalk. Now, I want to share another outstanding book. Um, this one is called Mr. Waffles. I am not <laughs> a cat person, so you really won't see too many opportunities where I'm looking at this from a perspective of, you know, this is my truth in terms of I have cats. I have horrific pet allergies. But <laughs> what this story does that I love, and I don't see it too often in children's picture books. So this is not the beginning of the story. This is sort of like a teaser page because this is when the story ends. But this page sort of sets up the context for the fact that this cat, Mr. Waffles, has a lot of toys, and he is clearly not impressed with the toys. And what I like is that the story starts as soon as you open the book, and you begin to see all of the toys <laughs> that this cat is walking away from that uh, his owner purchased, and the cat just can't be bothered. But the story begins to take off. Now, remember what I shared with Chalk. How you choose to tell this story is completely up to you in terms of the language and all of the things you may choose to delve into, right? But you have the opportunity in this story to introduce gibberish. 
gibberish. What do you mean? I mean literal gibberish, like bloop, 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 like whatever. That's that option. And you also have the opportunity, if you're not a uh, multilingual family, if you just like the idea of playing with different languages, to insert gibberish. When the aliens show up, and this is the aliens, they've landed. You know, this is their little ship in real life. It's about the size of the toys. But here are the aliens. So you have one language and where the cat is in their world. So that could be a language here. You can play around with introducing gibberish or you can invite the child to input a, make up their own language in general. Because look at the symbols that are here. This is an opportunity to allow your child to create their own language. And it may be gibberish, but it's the whole idea of the language that they create or the sounds they create have to match the visual images that are happening in the story. And that is just outstanding that you could do that with a picture book. Like, I know, I love picture books and I get so easily excited about it, but it's always fascinating to me when a story allows a child's imagination to participate in the storytelling of what's on the page. And so here again, you see these symbols. So you can see where the aliens are speaking. And then you see the cat. And you could choose to meow, make cat noises, because at this point, the only language that's on the page is the language of the aliens and cats making their own noises. So you have that to look forward to. But then you see, you know, there is this distress of them feeling trapped as the cat is consistently playing with their ship. But this is the other part that I think is so fascinating. The aliens eventually meet up with the insects that are hiding out in the house and they have a common enemy, which is the cat. And here you begin to see two languages, like the whole issue of communication barriers. If I speak English and someone else speaks a different language, how do we communicate? Does that mean that I can't communicate with you because you don't speak my language? Absolutely not. And that's why I love this story. Because when the insects meet the aliens, they find ways to communicate. And so just imagine when we talk about criticality, when we talk about building on the linguistic pathways of storytelling, that's where this story really just stands head and shoulders above a lot of picture books because it begins to show that whether you speak the same language or not, we all share a common experience of being hungry, of wanting to share. Look how <laughs> the ladybug is sharing. I think that's a cheese cracker, a cheese it <laughs> And the aliens respond by sharing their version of food. So you can begin to show how communication can still occur just in the respectful way we treat one another. And I wanna show you uh, another page because here they are, I love the graphic novel style of this picture book as well. But you see the aliens eating the cheese cracker and the insects enjoying the alien's food. And you're seeing them have a moment of understanding or just mutual collaboration. And so the story begins to highlight how they work together and how they reach uh, the resolution. And I'm not, I never try to show you the full a uh, picture book because I never want to ruin the story for you. But this is just a great opportunity to not only blend in languages or multiple languages, but invite children to come up with their own creative sounds or play around with different ways of speaking. Um, and then when you bring in the insects, because you have the aliens speaking the made up language, if you want to go in that direction, and you have another opportunity to play with sound and language and linguistic diversity when you think about the language you might want the insects to speak. And in these contexts, there are no right or wrong answers. 
That's the other thing I love about this book. And I want to also share this as well. Sometimes when we're teaching children multiple languages or we're dealing with some children who may not naturally be as communicative as other children, providing opportunities for them to communicate in the way they feel comfortable is a absolute gift in terms of bonding. And it can also take away some of the pressure that they may have around picture books because they feel that pressure to speak or they feel that pressure to do something that may be considered a hard or difficult task. But when you introduce a children's picture book, a wordless children's picture book, you're basically asking the child to be the cat where they just meow and you let them explore having fun with those concepts or you're asking the child to imagine what the aliens language means because it's triangles, circles, and symbols instead of words. And because nobody knows what the right or wrong answer is, nobody has to deal with your right, your wrong. Everyone's creativity can really just shine in this book. And so for that reason, I think Mr. Waffles is an outstanding book. Even though I'm not a pet person, even though I'll take a plant over a cat any day, <laughs> I will happily recommend uh, this wordless picture book. Oh, we are just humming along. I love it when I just get to teach. Although I do love your questions, but just know I'm having a ball uh, just sharing some of these outstanding resources with you. Now, this one is called Red Again. And what really stood out for me about this lovely picture book is that the main character... presents himself as stumbling across a red book. Now, you know how I feel about diversity. You know, like the last book, the diversity were aliens and insects. <laughs> I'm talking diversity all across the board. And so when we get to this story, you see a child coming across, uh, an older child coming across this red book. And so the story begins, I'm trying to, angle this. There we go. The story begins with the ability of the child to, you know, take the book home, climb up the stairs, and begin to open up the book. And that's when the character begins to realize that there's something unique about this book. The image he sees when he opens the book is, you know, looks like a geographic location of someone in the islands and someone on a boat. And that creates an opportunity because this is a magical book. That character then finds the same book floating in the ocean. And when they open it, they see where our original character is. And so the book becomes a window into two different worlds. I talked about bridging uh, cultural bit. I talked about building cultural bridges. And this story just really illustrates what a book can do in the terms of look how now this character is realizing that they're seeing someone who's also seeing them. Because in this picture, you see the picture within picture, like it's meta in the imagery. Here is our original character looking at her in his book. And she's realizing <laughs> that she can see him looking at her. And so isn't that the beauty of what languages, multiple languages, books and stories do? They allow us glimpses into someone else's perspective. They, uh, language allows us access into different cultures, getting to hear people, experience things, and stories are the common thread that connect us. So for those reasons, I think Red Again is just a beautiful 
story. And again, because it's wordless, teachers, adults, educators, you can play around with how you explain this story, how you choose to use this imagery if you're teaching a certain thing, if you're teaching a lesson about water, if you're teaching a lesson about travel, all of these things, you can play around with it using different languages or just different concepts. So that was read again. Outstanding book. Okay, I saved the best for last. If you stuck with me, get ready. I'm about to blow your socks off because when I looked into this book, I was utterly just, I think I did a little, little, little scream because I'm like, oh my God, this is so cool. Oh, wait, before I do that, quick, quick shout out. Definitely want to highlight another, which is another great book that talks about perspectives. You have your character or how the story starts. And it's very artistic. It's very artistic. And I just wanted to share this one because I try to make sure that we're using books as windows and mirrors. When we talk about windows and mirrors, you want books that are mirrors of other children. So the child has the ability to see themselves in the story. But you also want the book to be a window that invites the child to think differently about certain things. And in this story, you know, a doorway opens up. The little girl's in bed. And then all of a sudden, here's this opportunity uh, to explore a different world. And here's what she finds when she does so. And she continues to explore and bring her cat with her. And you can create the storyline in whatever language you choose. But I want to skip ahead to one page that I really love. Because in this alternative universe or whatever secret passageway she's found, she encounters this beautiful, diverse world of other kids. And since we've been talking about linguistic diversity, here's an opportunity to play around with different languages and different sounds as you go to each child. Because if they all started in their beds, who's to say that they're all speaking the same language, okay? So just wanted to do a slight little detour, but I wanted to make sure I also shared this book with you uh, within today's Caring Conversation. All right. Now, without further ado or shiny nose, because, you know, the skincare is serious, <laughs> I want to share this amazing book that was published by the Australian government, because, you know, I'm global. So even my book recommendations are global in how I approach curation. But this book was the very first time I ever came across a picture book that approached storytelling in this way. All right, you're ready. You're ready. You ready? Okay, I think you're ready. Look at this! Oh my God. Okay, now the glare is something serious. So I'm gonna really, I'm gonna like feed this book to you. This page is in English, right? but this page is in Arabic. And here's the thing. This is the, this is the way the book starts. You have two. <laughs> How awesome is this? Oh my God. Oh, I got to calm down. This is just, oh my. When we talk about linguistic diversity, when we talk about criticality, the whole fact that people got together and dreamed up this beautiful, brilliant book that puts two languages side by side. And if we want to be critical, you're talking about Arabic and English. If we look at our world, if we look at the tensions that have existed between some English language speaking countries and some Arabic speaking countries, and if you expand that to religion, whoo, brilliant, deep, 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 deep but we'll bring it back to the childhood level. <laughs> All 
I told you, I stay, I stay woke. Anyhow, as you delve into this book, like it, it takes a little bit of dexterity. Let me scoot back so I can do this beautiful book justice. Each page allows you to see two different characters and what their day looks like. One child is in Australia. The other child is in Morocco. But they're both waking up. And you're seeing how this child starts their day compared to this child who starts it with prayer. Highlighting religion. And then the next page, look at this. The concept of getting dressed, which is something we all do. Like this story takes these common experiences and shows you how it happens in different parts of the world through the eyes of children. And if you're using this story, now this is a story you will not finish or I don't advise you try to finish this book all in one day. I would encourage you to really appreciate the detail of these stories because you have two stories in one. Now, for the way in which I was hosting this caring conversation, I shared the pages with you in duality. But depending on your child, you may want to explore one full story and then explore the other story because they're both wordless picture books, right? And after you have explored both stories independently, if that's your style, then you may want to go back and look at them in tandem and invite the child or invite the children or invite your students to talk about the differences, to speak on the similarities, and really begin to engage with what this story is telling you. But the power of the book is how they just show the differences in what their lives are. You literally have two complete stories within one. And it is just one of the most profound wordless picture books I've come across so far. Uh, again, I will always share the book descriptions, but I just want to thank the author and illustrator, uh, Jeannie Baker, for taking the time to create this beautiful bridge. And if you look at the way in which the book is illustrated, you can also see the care in which this story was told. Like these aren't drawings. She actually sat down and pieced together these collage type images. You see that? Just, oh. if you can believe it, uh, it's actually 8.57, like an hour just flies by. But I have had a wonderful time. And I'll, let me just go ahead and review all of the picture books I've shared with you so far in terms of multilingual learning, in terms of developing criticality, and in terms of always supporting linguistic diversity. So we looked at Mirror with Jeannie Baker. I shared very briefly another by Christian Robinson. Read Again by Barbara Lehman. Mr. Waffles uh, by David Wisner. My favorite, one of my favorites, because Mira really just stole my heart. Uh, <laughs> Chalk by Bill Thompson. This was like my main, my main, uh, this was formerly the champion until Mira sort of stepped into the ring and took the belt. <laughs> and then I started with a board book which really begins to bring in the concept of global exposure uh, with global babies. Yeah. And this book is actually, uh, I don't know who's the author on this one. Oh, this book is by the Global Fund for Children. So this is one of those think tank books that probably explains how they got all these authentic pictures. So yay. My name is Dr. Keisha. 
Thank you for letting me be my authentic self, glasses, hair, and all, and just sharing uh, some of the curated picture books that I selected to support you in teaching multiple languages, building diverse understandings of the world. And if anyone wants to go further, I could not enjoy working with you more in terms of curating uh, additional lists, really explaining how to go even deeper, because what I talked about is just the tip of the iceberg of what you can do when you're looking across the wide spectrum of early childhood and elementary learning. And thank you for joining Dr. Keisha Cares in another Caring Conversation. Be well, please stay safe, <laughs> and I'll see you next time. Bye.